No matter where we live, the city or the country, we must be ready all the time to do the right thing. Yes, we must all get ready now. Hello, and welcome to part three. This is where we're going to get into some of the nitty gritty of how all of this is wired together. Uh, this is going to be a bit of a complex uh, process to, to walk through. And if you haven't seen part two, I highly recommend that you go and you watch it because the conversation about the component pieces is fairly useful to understand before we get into the wiring. And um, I'm not going to recover it here. So I'm really just going to be talking about the, the path of power and how everything is connected together in this video. One last thing worth noting, while I am talking about this as if I were some authority on the subject, I am actually just kind of a DIY maker. Uh, I am not an expert electrician. I'm not even necessarily that much of an expert in computer hardware or electronics and wiring. So your mileage may vary. I will note it's always best to take your own safety precautions and understand exactly what you are doing when you are working with any amount of power. So with that said, let's take a look. So we're just going to move right down the line on this IO panel. Uh, what I will do as we do this is I will also kind of show the front panel so you can understand what the front looks like at the same time. So this first connection piece is quite simply just the power line to the battery in order to charge it. Uh, it is a pretty standard USB cable that I have cut and spliced into a USB micro. Um, this is one of those weird situations where you can't really get a standard USB front panel to micro. It's always just USB to USB, or rather USB-C to USB-C. Um, and so in order to get it to go down to micro, I had to splice in the power cables. That's all done uh, pretty simply, and then heat shrunk there. Moving that kind of <clears throat> out of the way, uh, the next item is the USB power connection. And so that is split and then spliced into the toggle switch. As you can see, it is at the bottom of the toggle switch, which means when that switch is in the on position, power is running from the uh, external power into the overall circuit. On this same switch, in between, in the middle, you have the power out, and that is going to the other three switches. Those are all done in parallel. If you see this cable right here, I have the power cable power out coming and it splits into three different power cables, each going to a different switch. And finally, the two above it, those are the power from the battery. And the battery power is, well, right here. When you have the battery, when you have the battery, plugged in like it should be to this USB cable. Uh, this USB cable is again split into the two different power pieces. So you have red is always the hot and black is the ground. Um, and so you have it connecting in, which means when the switch is in the down position, uh, it is sending power from the battery to the rest of the circuit. It's probably worth taking a moment here as an aside to talk about voltage and amperage and how that kind of plays into all of this. I'll note that normally you can get this information just about anywhere, but I like to use analogies and the analogies that I like to use are tied to the idea of water and water pressure. So I've always heard it said as uh, voltage is like water pressure. And so a five volt system like this has five volts of pressure. Um, tied to that is the concept of amperage and that is the flow of the water. Which means that, um, and there is some ties between amount of amperage possible within voltage, uh, but the main thing to note is basically that as long as the pressure is there, uh, you can use up certain amount of flow, but the sum aggregate of all the devices is going to add up to your total amperage. So if you have a Raspberry Pi that is using, say, 2.1 amps of the power flow, and you have the touchscreen that is using, I don't know, 0.5 amps, and you have a uh, little uh, network switch here that's using in, uh, less than an amp, the sum aggregate of that is probably going to be somewhere around 3 amps. 
So keep that in mind um, because when things are in parallel, they're all drawing uh, all the power at the same time, and that is the total amperage. That doesn't just apply to the things that are currently wired into it. That also applies to any devices that we have connected to the Raspberry Pi. So the keyboard in the case is going to have a certain amount of amperage draw. Uh, any USB peripheral is going to have a certain amount of amperage draw. Now a lot of that is actually built into the theoretical maximum of the Raspberry Pi itself. Most Raspberry Pis say they're operating anywhere between 2.1 to 3 amps and that range is generally considered the maximum it would be drawing even with peripherals in them. All that said, it's kind of a rule of thumb and you can run into situations where you are drawing much more power than can be supplied in a five volt system. So keep that in mind when you're thinking about what all you're going to have plugged up and have on at the same time. Let's get back into the wiring. Now as we move on to this next switch, this is the Raspberry Pi switch. So coming into the middle pins on this is the power from the first switch, the uh, red cable being split off in parallel with the other ones, and uh, then the black grounding cable feeding back in to the grounding cable that goes back to that first switch, thus completing the circuit. Now I will note that um, there are some aspects to this first switch that we need to cover that I'm going to actually change in the future as I am kind of developing this over time. The first is that uh, the power doesn't come out from this Raspberry Pi switch directly to the Raspberry Pi itself. So if you actually look, I'll actually point out the uh, Raspberry Pi's power source here. That is right here. So here's the Raspberry Pi power source. It is a USB-C cable in this case, because this is a Raspberry Pi 4. And you can see it's a braided cable, and that's the same braided cable that I've run kind of underneath right here. And that power cable is connected to this switch, but it's connected through this little getup. So I have a fuse. Uh, this fuse is a three amp fuse, which is now protecting the Raspberry Pi. And that's done in serial, which means power is coming from the switch into the fuse right here using this solder connector. And then it's going out to the power cable here. Connected in parallel with all of that. And if you don't understand what serial or parallel means in circuitry, we'll talk a bit about that. Um, but connected in parallel is this capacitor. What this means is power coming in cannot go beyond three amps, otherwise this fuse will blow and it'll protect the Raspberry Pi. Likewise, if power is cut, either because power is lost or because I'm switching between external or battery power, I have this capacitor to feed the power. And the capacitor is in parallel because as that circuit is cut from the external power, this now creates a complete circuit with just the Raspberry Pi in and of itself. So you can imagine this capacitor to the Raspberry Pi is all in circuit, forget everything else before it. Now the reason I'm not a big fan of how I've done this in retrospect is I'm really only protecting my Raspberry Pi from a power surge and I'm really only giving it power in the, in the uh, kind of cut off of power if I'm flipping a switch or if I lose power. The reason that's not great is something I learned in retrospect. And the first thing I learned in retrospect is that the Raspberry Pi touchscreen, the 7-inch touchscreen, uh, doesn't play nicely with losing power in the middle of everything. So I had thought that if I switched power, uh, I would just keep the, uh, the Raspberry Pi itself going and the screen would reconnect. That was um, apparently uh, in error. Um, it does not work that way. And now knowing that it doesn't work that way, I will need to go back and kind of redo all this. Likewise, I'm not protecting my screen from a power surge. So I'm eventually going to rewire all this to just be at the kind of power incoming piece or rather the outgoing piece so it connects and protects all the devices. Looking behind the auxiliary cable here, just keep in mind that is an auxiliary cable. It is just splicing from the jack into a pretty standard audio connection. Um, behind that is the switch for the display. So again, the way that's working is off of the very first toggle switch, I have power coming out again. 
in parallel to all the other switches. This one going into the middle two for the display switch. And then the bottom two pins are power going out to the display. So when the switch is in an on position, uh, that power is flowing. Uh, you can see the wires here coming up. And the way I have this set up is these are basically just done as pin connectors. I have a female uh, GPIO pin style connection point to the power. And then that is these power cables that go to the uh, display that is below. You can also see there are some other cables related to the display here that are connected to the Raspberry Pi itself. Moving on. The final switch is for power going to the network switch. And so again, you have power coming from the very first power switch. It's again in parallel for the other switches, comes into the center. And again, just like the other three, or the other two rather, it's going into the, the little front pieces here. And those are connected to uh, a spliced cable that is just part of this network switch power jack. So I just took the default power jack that normally comes with a wall adapter, cut it, split it, and spliced it. And so that is how the power actually flows from the very first switch coming in from the USB power on the front panel, all the way through to the other three switches in parallel to each other. So they're all getting power and then going to all the component devices. This one, uh, uh, this next component is probably the hardest to talk about the wiring for just because there's a lot of wires in a very, very tight space. Uh, I will do a kind of color coded uh, output for you so you can see what this looks like on your screen. Um, but this is the mil spec connector, the six pin circular connector. Um, I have it uh, set up as you can see in this diagram with the color wires and they're connected to these pins on the Raspberry Pi. That is allowing currently, I believe, for a serial connection. Finally, the last four items on the front panel are just USB cables and an Ethernet cable. And those are literally just pass-throughs to the Raspberry Pi. You can see them plugged in. Here are the three USB cables. Here's the Ethernet cable. I kind of have them all jammed up to the side as my cables cabling solution. Um, but that's really it. That's how everything is connected. A note on color coding, it is worth noting, uh, it's pretty standard color coding when you think about it. Red wires are basically always representing a hot power or positive power, so that's power in. Black cables are basically always representing the ground or the negative power line, uh, so red in, black out basically. Um, but where this changes a bit is where I am splitting things out in parallel. So specifically the next three switches, uh, I'm using gray and orange. The gray is uh, tied to the black. So anywhere you see a gray wire, that is um, a ground wire that's in parallel. And likewise, anywhere you see an orange cable, that is considered a hot wire or positive wire in parallel. And you can see where those are soldered here in their parallel connections going into the primary power switch. All in all, the wiring for this deck is relatively simple. The circuit diagram I provide in the video description below uh, certainly will help you to understand the logical layout where maybe the video of the wires themselves may have failed. Um, but it wasn't really that complex of a thing to put together. It was just a matter of deciding exactly how I wanted to wire it, what methods I wanted to use, if I wanted to use solder, if I wanted to use a uh, spatula connector. Uh, certainly a lot of the footwork in terms of putting this together from an electrical standpoint was done by Jay Dozier out of Back7.co. At the time I built this deck, he actually had not been providing a wiring diagram for his build. Now he actually has, which is actually a great resource. I kind of wish I had that at the time. I basically reverse engineered it by looking at pictures on his website. But with all that said, I've got my deck put back together. It is whole again, ready to go. I'll probably end up putting it back in my box and back into storage a little bit later. Uh, in the next video, I will be covering 3D printing and the 3D modeling aspects. I'm looking forward to this video. I'm not 
I'm not really quite as clear as what I'm going to be able to uh, impart upon you as the viewing audience with that video. Uh, it might be a little bit more meandering, but I did find that the 3D modeling aspect is where I maybe actually learned the most in this project. I certainly learned a lot with electrical diagrams and, and how to wire things, but um, I learned a lot about the usage of Blender and kind of how to make certain decision points for uh, doing rapid prototyping with a 3D printer. So I'm really looking forward to doing that video, even though I really don't know which direction that's going to take. Uh, but with all that said, I guess we will go ahead and close out this video. Appreciate you taking the time to watch, and I'll see you in the next one.